Hello and welcome to Always Bored Never Boring. Recently I made a very silly video looking at the pictures on the back of board game boxes that show people playing the game. If you missed that video, I'll link to it in the video description so you can check it out for yourself if you would like to, but to get to the point, there was one game that didn't appear in that video, but which should have done. The game was Dark World, and the reason it didn't appear in the video was because… I didn't own it. I used to own it. In fact, I owned not only Dark World, but also Village of Fear and Dragon's Gate, the two expansions that also served as standalone games in their own right. I sold all three many moons ago, before I had ever even thought about running a YouTube channel. But making that video about the photographs on the back of board game boxes did get me thinking about Dark World. Specifically, it got me thinking that even though I had reviewed the game on my blog in another lifetime, it really would be good to showcase it right here with an updated version of that review. So thanks to contributions from the lovely folk in the Always Bored Never Boring Members Club, I've gone and bought Dark World again. It's complete, it's in good condition, except for maybe this paint job on the manticore, and if you thought the back of the box was awesome, and it really is, just take a look at this cover. It's absolutely spectacular, and not in any way influenced by other previously released very successful board games. No siree Bob. This is something totally new. This is a piece of art that says, do you want to be a hero? Do you want to go on a quest? Then this is a game for you. A game where you can go on a hero's quest. Like, a hero quest. It's, you, you know, hero quest is a good game, innit? Okay, all joking aside, I don't care if this art is a little derivative. It's a piece by the awesomely talented Chris Baker, otherwise known as Fangorn, who also did work on a lot of other board games that get mentioned around these parts, like Battle Masters, Advanced Space Crusade, Chainsaw Warrior, and Classic Space Hulk. His work here is fantastic. It does exactly what it needs to, to catch your interest. It makes it very clear, this is a big box of adventures. This is a game that tells a story. Stories are important to me, in all things, but particularly in games. When I play a game, I'm not playing to beat someone. I'm not playing to prove my intellect. I am playing so that I can sit down with people I love, or at least tolerate, and create stories. That's why I'm such a big fan of games with a strong theme. And frankly, there aren't many games that look more thematic than Dark World. This is a game that had seen what Hero Quest had done, had seen what Space Crusade had done, and had said, I can top that. And it did. Try. It tried really hard. It was good and it tried really, really hard to be great. It was beautiful with an awe-inspiring table presence, but it also had rules that incorporated some damned fine ideas. To begin, you have to assemble the three-dimensional board, with its maze of rooms leading to a fabulous plastic throne room that would look great on any tabletop battlefield. Then, you and up to three friends each select a hero. There's a knight, a barbarian, a dwarf, and a ranger. The party's wizard clearly took a day off. It's fine. I'm sure you won't need any magic on your quest. Right? Each hero is given a basic grey weapon. There are four to choose from, pick whichever one takes your fancy, they all do the same thing, which is nothing. And look how cute this is, the characters hold the weapons, sort of. Each hero also gains a hand of three cards from the hit and miss deck, which we will talk more about in a moment. And then you all set off into the dungeon with the aim of killing another one of your friends who will be playing the awesomely named Korak the Cobra Nemesis a villain who has escaped right out of a Saturday morning cartoon, and who, unlike that cowardly Zargon fellow, is prepared to put his own neck on the line in But while the heroes are all working towards the same goal, they aren't all working towards it together. They keep track of their own kills and loot, and there will only be one overall winner. It's all for one, and one for themselves. After all, what's the point in overthrowing an evil tyrant if you aren't going to get all the credit? As such, more than a dungeon crawler, more than an adventure game, this is a race. Not for glory, but for points. Each turn, a hero can take three actions, and each action is a movement of one space or a single attack. And yes, that means you can move three times, attack three times, or make a combination of moves and attacks, in any order. Roll and move has rolled right out of the door. From the very first turn, the heroes are getting to make real decisions. 
No, those are not going to be particularly tough decisions. In most cases, the best course of action will be obvious, but they are decisions nonetheless. The heroes begin at the castle entrance, and to determine the order they activate, Korak gives the Mace of Chaos a good shake before placing it on top of the throne room. The order of the coloured balls inside the mace dictate the order in which the heroes will take their turns. They then move through the various rooms, each of which has its own colour palette and style. When they reach a door, they can open it. Really, open it. The doors are on hinges. And then Zargon, I mean Hordak, I mean Korak, rubs his hands with glee because it's time for the monsters to arrive. Each room has a number printed on it. This number represents the total strength of the monsters that Korak can spawn in that room the first time a hero opens the door. Each monster has a strength value printed under the base, which is kept secret from the heroes. Korak selects one or two monsters to place in the room with total strength less than or equal to the room's printed value. Korak can select weak monsters with a total strength well below the value printed on the room or the strongest possible combo. The heroes won't know for sure whether monsters represent a serious threat or if they are just a bluff, a speed bump intended for them to waste valuable resources they will need for tougher fights ahead. Maybe they are about to battle two weak monsters, a weak monster and a strong monster, two average monsters. The only clues to work it out are the maximum strength value assigned to that room, as printed on the board, the number and type of monsters spawned, and the known strength values of any monsters that were previously slain and removed from Korak's pool of available enemies. Weak or strong, all of these monsters are ready for a fight. Heroes can engage in a fight with a monster if they have any of their actions left. Each action lets them attack once, and they are attempting to inflict enough hits with one attack to match or exceed the monster's strength. To make the attack, when using a basic grey weapon, heroes roll two combat dice. These are custom dice showing blanks, one hit, or two hits. But hold up. If each dice can only score a maximum of two hits, and you are only rolling two dice, how can you hope to kill a monster with a strength of five or more? I'm glad I asked, because this is the science part. After rolling the dice, a hero can play up to three hit cards from their hand. Each card played adds one hit. We have honest to goodness dice mitigation, combined with a push your luck mechanism. Real decisions that add another dimension to what is otherwise an incredibly simple combat system. Imagine this, you're in a room with a single ogre and you have rolled four swords. The room has a printed strength of five, so the ogre may have a strength of five, meaning you need five hits to kill it. If you don't match or exceed the monster's strength, it shrugs off the attack completely. No hit point tracking, no partial successes. You will kill the ogre, or you won't. But maybe Korak was bluffing. Maybe this ogre is just a sentry with no real combat experience. Maybe he's a runt who got left behind because he was too weak to keep up with the rest. You have one valuable hit card in your hand. What do you do? Obviously, shouting your battle cry, SPOON! You throw down your hit card, and then you secretly check the base of the monster, because you don't want those other heroes to know what you know. This isn't a co-op game, remember. The base strength of the ogre is a three. You wasted your card. Korak laughs. But as you casually slide the ogre off the end of your sword, a small glass bottle slips from its hand and rolls across the cobbles. What's this? A healing potion. Yes, like all good dungeon crawling games, looting the dead is a prerequisite for victory. Each monster will drop a healing potion, which restores all your lost hit points, some magic boots, which grant you an additional three actions in your turn, or a grenade. A grenade, which you can throw at groups of enemies. These are all one-use items, and they are all incredibly useful. The best thing? They are represented with cute little plastic miniatures that clip into the bases of the monsters, so you can see in advance what loot you will get when you kill something. About to die? Then target the monster with the healing potion. Need to get ahead of the other heroes? Then go for the monster with the fancy footwear. Additionally, when you kill a monster, you get to take that monster as a grisly trophy. You get a new hit or miss card from the deck, and Korak has to give you a random gold coin ranging in value from 1 to 5. So wait. Let's recap. An action point system, dice mitigation, push your luck, bluffing, and real decisions about who and when to attack. And grenades. This game is awesome, right? After you have finished an attack, 
If you fail to kill the monster, it will immediately retaliate. Monsters roll two dice, with the exception of Korak himself, who rolls three, and any hits are totaled. But before that damage is applied, the hero can play up to two missed cards from their hand, reducing the number of hits by one for each card played. The remainder of the hits are deducted from the hero's hit points total and recorded by rotating the hero's clicky base. Wait, what? Clicky base? Oh yeah, long before hero clicks was ever a thing, the heroes of Dark World were recording their health with click bases. This game really was ahead of its time. Once all the heroes have activated in the sequence determined by the Mace of Chaos, Korak gets a turn. They take three actions with each visible monster, which means monsters could attack up to three times each. The process for monsters attacking is exactly the same as for heroes, except the monsters roll first and then heroes get a chance to retaliate. It's all very straightforward, and unfortunately Korak's decisions at this point don't amount to more than moving adjacent to the weakest hero in the room and then rolling dice to try to kill them. But eventually, the echoing clash of steel on steel dies down. The Barbarian and the Dwarf exchange a nervous glance. They faced tougher monsters before, but there is something else. Something wrong with this place. The hairs on the back of their necks stand up, and the Haunter silently glides through the chamber, stealing the life force of any hero or monster unlucky enough to get in its path. There are spooky goings on in this castle. The Haunter is a very cool Grim Reaper type character, a vile creature that Korak is allowed to summon once per turn. They roll a 10 sided dice, on a 10 the Haunter sleeps and everyone breathes a sigh of relief. Otherwise, the Haunter will fly along the board following a straight path dictated by the dice roll. Anything it touches, monster or hero, dies instantly. Luckily, Heroes regenerate, and the worst that happens is they lose a bit of ground by being sent back to the starting space, where there also happens to be a handy fountain of healing to recover their hit points to maximum, and a teleporter to get them back into the thick of the action quickly. After the Haunter has done its thing, a new turn begins. Then it's back into the fray for more of the same. Along the way, heroes will find secret doors. If they stand next to them and make a successful roll with the D10, they immediately hop through to the other side. The really fun thing is if there is a hero or monster immediately on the other side, they swap places. It's got a real Scooby-Doo vibe. Also, and even more usefully, heroes may find a treasure chest. If there are no monsters in the room with the chest, a hero may stand adjacent to it to claim the golden weapon inside. These weapons are great powerful relics that Korak should probably have locked away somewhere safe because armed with these fantastical, shimmering, golden, magic-imbued weapons of destruction, a hero can roll three dice in combat. And I guess that's basically how the game plays out. The heroes will eventually make it through the rooms of the castle to the arena, where they are gifted more hit or miss cards based on whether they arrived first, second, third or fourth, and then the final showdown begins. Korak can summon up to six monsters that haven't been deployed already, and also has access to the monstrous manticore. It gets brutal fast. There are monsters all over the place, and Korak himself is a beast. He has a strength of seven, so it's only possible to kill him with a good dice roll and at least one hit card. And should he win and reduce a hero to zero hit points, that hero is out of the game. No chance to revive, it's game over. If any other monster should defeat a hero in the arena, thankfully they are not out and neither are they teleported back to the castle entrance. Instead, they are returned to the doom step at the threshold of the arena and they must discard a magic item, a card, a coin or a monster trophy. Why? Because when Korak is finally slain, or once all the heroes have been defeated, it's time for a point salad. Every hero adds up the strength of monsters they killed plus the value of any coins they have collected. They also gain one point for each unused hit or miss card they have, and if a player killed Korak, they score an additional five points. The player with the highest score is the ultimate winner. Whether or not Korak was defeated is pretty much a secondary consideration. And that's your lot. In summation, this game is beautifully presented. It has an incredible toy factor with the miniatures, opening doors, spinning secret doorways, interchangeable weapons, and plastic power-ups. Plus, it has some really great ideas packed into it, like the dice mitigation and bluffing elements. Honestly, I think something like the hit and miss cards would be a great addition to HeroQuest. In fact, 
Avalon Hill seems to think so too, as they recently added dice mitigation to Hero Quest in the arena combat system for against the Ogre Horde. But for all the chrome and for all the good ideas, Dark World is still incredibly simple. Sadly, too simple. Take for example the four heroes you can pick from. They look different, but in the game they all work in exactly the same way. Same hit points, same number of actions, same number of attack dice, no special powers. Take for example the starting grey weapons you can pick from and slot into the hands of your totally generic hero. They look different, but in the game they all work in exactly the same way, they let you roll two attack dice. Take for example the magic golden weapons. They look cool, but they don't do anything special, they just give you one extra attack dice. In the rules it specifies which weapon each of the heroes prefers to use, but that doesn't translate into any in-game mechanism. Any hero can use any weapon, it doesn't matter. And then there are the monsters. Skeletons, mummies, orcs and ogres, a beautiful horrible wave of merciless dungeon denizens that want to rip your throat out by rolling two combat dice. It doesn't matter what kind of monster you are facing, an orc works the same way as every other creature. There are no special powers, no variable attack strengths, nothing. Nothing. And that's a real shame, the game has so much chrome you might go blind when you open the box, but not enough of that chrome was applied to the rules. It's half a job. The rules that are there are good, they actually solve a lot of problems that rules for these sorts of games often have. There's no role to move, there are choices to make, there are things for the bad guy to do, but there is so much more that could have been done, so much that a fan might add for their own enjoyment. Special skills, variable stats, abilities for monsters, traps, more treasure and equipment, exploration, narrative based scenarios and more. Village of Fear and Dragon's Gate would later add more depth to the game, but wouldn't really solve these core issues. And while they changed the setting and the foes, ultimately you were playing the same game. As a competitive game that plays in a single sitting without relying on stories, campaigns or secret map layouts, you could argue that Dark World is more replayable than something like HeroQuest. But you won't replay it. Not as much as you should. Not as much as you want to. Because stories in gaming are important, and this is a game that desperately wants to tell stories. Stories of adventure, stories of heroes fighting impossible odds, stories of monsters and ghosts and evil tyrants, of triumphs and tragedies, hope and despair. But Dark World doesn't tell stories, it tells a story. One story. The same story every time you play. And that is it from me for now, thank you so much for watching, if you like this video please consider pressing the like button, if you really like this video please consider subscribing if you don't already do so, and hopefully I will see you all again very soon. Bye bye everyone, bye bye.